The Gospel of Mark, chapter 2, verse 13, is where we resume our study today. Get your Bible, open it up to Mark, chapter 2. We'll begin in just a minute. I tell you about the Scripture Verse by Verse website at the beginning of every single broadcast here on Scripture Verse by Verse because there you can study God's Word just like we're going to do today, verse by verse using my audio Bible messages. All you have to do is choose from one of four series that are complete, going on five, all archived there. Choose the series, then the book of the Bible, the section, the chapter. Click and listen. Bring your Bible and a hunger for God's Word because that's all you ever need at the Bible verse by verse dot com. <clears throat> And Father, we pray that you would sanctify us by your truth. Your word is truth. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, Mark 2, 13. And he, Jesus, went forth again by the seaside. And all the multitude came unto him, and he taught them, which is something that he was always doing. I think about what it must have been like to be one of his apostles, one of the twelve. What, what a privilege. And I know, take away Judas, <clears throat> the other ones all suffered horribly and were persecuted because of their relationship with Jesus Christ and how they were witnesses to whom much is given, much is expected. They were given much. They, Those 12 men <clears throat> who were with Jesus for three plus years were the most privileged men to ever walk on planet Earth because they got to observe the Son of God, God manifest in the flesh, the eternal God, the Creator, and every time he moved his lips, he was speaking the word of God. So when it says, <clears throat> Jesus taught them, which is something that he was always doing, whether it was a formal teaching setting or not, it doesn't matter, he's God. He was always teaching by his words, by his behavior. So Jesus got away from the house, Peter's house, and the crowds. He found himself a bigger area so that he could teach the Word of God there as well. And it was by the seaside. And of course, the crowd followed him. 14. And as he passed by, he saw Levi, the son of Alphaeus, sitting at the tax office and said unto him, Follow me. And he arose and followed him. And I'll bet you the apostles who are walking with Jesus at this point were shocked that Jesus would go up and start a conversation, brief one, with Levi and invite Levi, the tax collector, to follow him. And he did. And he became a convert. He became the Apostle Matthew. And this was quite a convert because Levi was a notorious sinner. And that's why I said people were probably surprised. Levi was a tax collector, and he was sitting in his tax collecting booth collecting taxes when Jesus called him, and he got up. He left everything, which if you were surprised that Jesus talked to this guy, you were probably twice as surprised that he actually followed Jesus because he left everything, all that money to follow the Lord Jesus Christ. The Jews despised Levi and all tax collectors because they all worked for the Roman Empire. 
the occupying power in Rome, I mean, I should say in Israel. The tax collectors worked for the Roman Empire, collecting taxes from their fellow Jews to give to Rome. And if that wasn't bad enough, this is what really made it bad. These tax collectors would collect more than what they needed to, more than what Rome demanded. And whatever they collected more than what was needed by Rome or demanded by Rome, they get to keep the rest of it as a bonus. That's why they were so rich. They were all crooks. But Jesus invited Levi to follow him, and he did, because no one is too sinful for Jesus to save. No one is too sinful for Jesus to want to save or to save, in spite of what some people may think. I had a, I had a professing Christian who had gone to my church for quite a while. She shocked me. She shocked me because there was this terrible sinner who got saved, professed to be a Christian and got saved. And she just couldn't believe it. Seriously, she could not believe it, that somebody that bad could ever be a Christian. And it concerned me, not for him, but for her. Because it was obvious that for some reason, it had never sunk in what it meant to be a Christian. And that's that step one, is to realize that you are not worthy. And if she's thinking that she is somehow more worthy to be a Christian than this other fellow who claims to be a Christian, well, then that's troubling. Because I'm wondering what she's, I wonder if she's saved. I've got a hard time believing it, see? But anyway, Levi's one of the bad ones. But notice 15, and it came to pass that as Jesus sat to eat in his house, in Levi's house, that is, many tax collectors and sinners sat also together with Jesus and his disciples, for there were many, and they followed him. Look at this. Levi has Jesus over to his house for a dinner party, and Jesus is the guest of honor. Levi invites all of his corrupt friends to that, gen to that dinner with Jesus. Jesus was not popular with sinners because he watered down the truth. Sorry. Jesus was not popular with sinners because he watered down the truth, because he didn't. Jesus was popular with sinners because although he told the truth that many, most, did not like, it was clear that he cared about them. So at least some of the sinners who had a conscience still, and understood that they were bad, appreciated the fact that Jesus would take the time to talk to them and care about them. So this place is jam-packed with people. And notice 16. And when the scribes and the Pharisees saw him eat with tax collectors and sinners, they, <clears throat> they said unto his disciples, How is it that he eats and drinks with tax collectors and sinners? The self-righteous religious leaders never would, have, never would have even talked to Levi. They certainly never would have had dinner with him and his tax collector friends. And so these religious leaders ask the disciples of Jesus, why is Jesus eating with these horrible sinners? <clears throat> Isn't that interesting? These cowards gutless wonders, then ask Jesus himself. Instead, they complained to his disciples that he was eating with them. But look at 17. When Jesus heard it, he said unto them, They that are whole have no need 
of the physician, but they that are sick. I came not to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. <clears throat> so Jesus tells them that he spends time with them to call them to repentance. That's why I do it. Mr. and High and Mighty, Haughty Religious Leaders, that's why I do it because I call them to repentance because I don't want them to go to hell. Jesus didn't water down the truth to be popular with these hor <clears throat> horrible sinners. Instead, he told them the truth. And just in case any of them were hungry enough to want truth, so that they could be saved, Jesus was there giving them the truth. If you give, if you give the world the truth, like Jesus did, without watering it down, then you are at least giving people an opportunity to be saved. Most people won't like you because of it, but that doesn't matter. God will like you. And there is a remnant of people who will accept the truth and they will always thank God for you, that you gave them the truth. And that's why I proclaim the word of God without watering it down and have been for over 37 years here on scripture verse by verse. Just give them the truth. They don't deserve to hear it and be saved, but God deserves to have his message proclaimed because that's what he wants. And he wants to give people an opportunity to be saved. 18. And the disciples of John and of the Pharisees used to fast. And they came and said unto him, Why do the disciples of John and the Pharisees fast, but your disciples fast not? So the religious leaders, people in general, I guess, asked Jesus, why are you not like John the Baptist? Because his disciples fast and your disciples do not fast. How come? 19. Jesus said unto them, can the friends of the bridegroom fast while the bridegroom is with them? As long as they have the bridegroom with them, they cannot fast. So Jesus answered them. He said, he said it wouldn't be appropriate for my disciples to fast. Why would they do that? Why would they do that? What is there to fast about? Fasting is a sign of sorrow as well as fervent prayer. Why, why would they be filled with sorrow and fasting? I mean, for this three plus years, they are all having a great time. They're in the presence of the very Son of God, God manifest in the flesh. They are, they are living with Him. They are listening to Him. They are watching Him. They are learning from Him. It's wonderful. He's healing the sick. He's raising the dead. He's curing lepers. He's casting out demons. He's setting people free. He's giving, he's giving people new, a new lease on life, literally. What a wonderful thing. This is not the time to fast and mourn as if something is going on that's, that's terrible. It won't even make sense. But then Jesus says this, But the days will come when the bridegroom shall be taken away from them, and then shall they fast in those days. So, yeah, it's not appropriate for them to fast during these good times any more than it would be appropriate for you to go to a wedding celebration and not eat and sit in the corner and mourn and fast. What? That's the time of celebration. And then Jesus adds, he says, you know, bad times are coming for my followers. I'm not going to always be here. They're going to be carrying the ball, as it were, here on earth, and they're going to be suffering because of it, and they're going to miss me because I'm not here. That's going to be... There'll be plenty to fast about in those days. But now is not the time. There's no virtue in being sad. 
if there's nothing to be sad about. There's no virtue in trying to be happy when there is something to be sad about. The Bible says, laugh with those who laugh and weep with those who weep. There's time for both. Just walk with the Lord, take advantage of the good that you have, and trust God during the bad. Okay, we'll stop right there for today's study. All of God's Word with me at the Bible, versebyverse.com. Choose, click, and listen. And if you'd like to be a part of Scripture verse by verse, you can be by praying for me and the Word of God. Because the second that you pray, you become a part of this ministry, and I appreciate it. And also, when you take a break from studying with me at the Bible, verse by verse dot com, go to the front page, click the donate button, and prayerfully give us a Lord may lead, because that also makes you a part of this ministry. Thanks for studying with me. I'll see you next time. Until then, so long.